ULA's next-gen Vulcan rocket is undoubtedly a step up from the Atlas V, and it's much cheaper than the Delta IV. But how will it stand up to the next generation of commercial launchers like Starship, New Glenn, and the Falcon Heavy? What kind of missions will the new rocket carry? And what are ULA's plans past Vulcan? All that and more in today's video. Lots of people take a look at SpaceX and especially Starship with its absurdly low cost of $2 million and 100 tons to low Earth orbit and just discount any other competitor. And while SpaceX are definitely revolutionizing the launch business, ULA still has a chance to be competitive with Vulcan. Vulcan will be powered by two B-4 engines made by Blue Origin. The B-4 engine is a liquid, natural gas-powered staged combustion cycle. A staged combustion cycle works by burning a small fraction of both the oxidizer and the fuel in what is called a pre-burner. The pre-burner is basically a small rocket engine that is used to spin a turbine that pumps the oxidizer and the fuel into the combustion chamber. When you're talking volumes of fuel not measured in gallons, but Olympic swimming pools, conventional fuel pumps just don't cut it. This type of cycle is more efficient than typical gas generator cycle engines like the Merlin, because gas generators dump the pre-burner exhaust out the side, while staged combustion engines take the exhaust they generate and pump it back into the combustion chamber. In the BE-4, the pre-burner is burnt oxidizer rich meaning the ratio of fuel to oxidizer is skewed in the favor of the oxidizer. This adds some extra complexity because oxygen-rich combustion is really, really hot. The space shuttle main engine runs fuel-rich for this exact reason. Heating is a really hard problem to solve. The B-4 is also a good choice when it comes to reusability. It's got a really low chamber pressure at 134 bar compared to Raptor with its 320 bar pressure and full flow staged combustion. But with this complexity comes benefits. The Raptor has a 330 sea level ISB and a 350 vacuum ISB, with Elon Musk saying 380 ISB is the goal. This is compared with the BE-4's 310 sea level ISB with a 340 ISB in a vacuum. Despite its relative simplicity, ULA and Blue Origin have been having trouble with their workhorse engine. It's delayed Vulcan's first launch date from 2020 to 2021, and any further delays would start to put Vulcan's launch contracts in danger, especially its certification flights for national security launches. This basically ensures Blue Origin will be held to account for any more delays, and with reports that Bezos has been holding Blue Origin to the fire recently, means we will almost certainly see Vulcan launch sooner rather than later. Vulcan's tanks are another work of engineering. They use orthogrid aluminum barrels, which apart from being mass efficient, also make a very good background for ULA's CEO, Tori Bruno. This was an improvement over the separate bulkheads used in the Delta IV, which was not able to have separate bulkheads thanks to the temperature difference between liquid oxygen and hydrogen, an issue which is not present in the methane-oxygen Vulcan. And if you really want to learn more about the way they make these tanks, you should definitely check out Smarter Every Day's interview with ULA's Tori Bruno as they take a tour of ULA's rocket factory. And while you won't see these on every Vulcan flight, Vulcan uses strap-on Gem 63 XL boosters to enhance the payload capacity. These are going to replace the Aerojet Rocketdyne manufactured AJ-60 boosters, and interestingly, they'll be able to offer configurations that include six strap-on boosters, while the Atlas V could only have five. This was because of liquid fuel feed lines on the outside of the tank that could not be occluded. Aerojet was the real loser of the Vulcan procurement decisions, losing out on both the first stage engines and booster choices. Only the Centaur 5's two RL-10 engines are manufactured by them. It's been pretty sad to see such a giant of the aerospace field slowly fade away, but honestly their prices have been exorbitant. You only need to look at the cost of the refurbished RS-25's NASA's using for SLS, or the fact that the RL-10 is one of the most expensive engines on the market to see why. 
Aerojet Rocketdyne has failed to adapt to the changing market. Raptor, Merlin, and the BE-4 are just orders of magnitude cheaper and are designed with reuse in mind, which is obviously the future for anyone who wants to make a claim to designing and launching an economical rocket. The Centaur 5 is probably one of the best parts of Vulcan, although it's also one of the most disappointing. Centaur had the potential to be so much more than what it is. ACES, or the Advanced Cryogenic Evolve Stage, was a plan by ULA to develop in-space refueling capabilities by using a Centaur upper stage as a fuel depot. This would allow for Vulcan to launch much, much more payload into Geo, the Moon, and beyond. Research was started into the concept in the 2000s, and when Obama came into the White House, he started pushing for more money for new space companies like SpaceX and new technologies like fuel depots that would be helpful in achieving the lofty and some would say too lofty goals of his administration. To do this, he created the Space Technology Program, but Congress wanted NASA to continue building rockets, and Congress always wins. So we got SLS, and Senator Shelby, a career politician who's been in the Senate since 1987, said that if he hears one more word about propellant depots, he's going to cancel the space technology program. This is because propellant depots would allow smaller and cheaper rockets like the Vulcan to launch beyond Earth orbit missions, which would put many valuable Alabama jobs at risk. Ironically, SLS is so underpowered with its Hydrolox core stage and bootlegged ICPS that it's going to need a rocket to separately launch the lander, which is pretty funny considering 60 years ago when we landed on the moon with Apollo, the command and descent modules were able to be launched in one go. At this point, I'm just glad this means more money is going to someone other than Boeing. The fairings are always one of ULA's proudest features and this one can fit about one and a half whales into it. And while it's no bird of prey, it's still more than enough room. Although SpaceX is coming out with an extended fairing option to cater to the government launch market. Now I want to get into what kind of payloads Vulcan will carry. It's already got 33 contracted payloads, and its first launch is a cool one. It's the Astrobotics Peregrine Lander for NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload System contract. The Peregrine Lander will carry 90 kilos of experiments to the previously volcanic Lacus Mortis region on the moon, including one absolutely minuscule rover called Asagumo, which despite the name is actually planned to be the first UK mission to the moon. It will use four legs to move around like a small insect into the lava caves nearby. On further missions, we'll even see a mothership dropping four Asagumos onto the lunar surface to fully map out the caves using LiDAR. And despite the fact their animation looks like it was taken out of War of the Worlds, I'm really excited to see how their mission pans out. And that's only one of the 28 NASA and international payloads that are going to be taken to the moon by the Peregrine Lander. I really think CLPS is one of the most underrated NASA programs out there. The moon has been ignored for far too long, and Vulcan is going to be leading the charge back. The second launch of Vulcan is another blockbuster. It's the Demo-1 mission for the Dream Chaser space plane, which started development in the 2000s and was originally meant to run on the same hybrid motors that power Spaceship 2. But when SNC pulled out of Spaceship 2, they developed an engine that runs on propane and nitrous oxide, a much more reusable configuration. Its heat shield is made of tough rock, which is much tougher than the shuttle tiles, another reusability choice. And while the Dream Chaser was bid as a crew launch vehicle for the commercial crew program, it was rejected and instead Sierra Nevada Corporation bid their Dream Chaser as a cargo resupply vehicle offering low G at re-entries and it was awarded a contract, along with Northrop Grumman and SpaceX, for six cargo missions to the ISS. Lots of people ask why the expendable Shooting Star module is included on the end of the otherwise reusable Dream Chaser. It was added after the selection for the CRS-2 contracts, and its purpose is to act as room for more pressurized or unpressurized cargo. 
This also allows the Shooting Star to be a garbage disposal unit for the ISS. The adaptability of the module also makes it an attractive option for the Department of Defense, who's contracted Sierra Nevada to turn discarded Shooting Star modules into unmanned space stations for experiments in space. And who knows, if Starliner doesn't pan out, maybe we'll see a manned version flying much sooner than we think. Another thing that deserves mention is the recent contract award to ULA and the Vulcan to develop a demonstration of a smart propulsion cryogenic system, using liquid oxygen and hydrogen on a Vulcan Centaur upper stage, which will test precise tank pressure control, tank to tank transfer, and multi-week propellant storage. I would not have wanted to be in Shelby's office when that news was released, but it was inevitable. With the green run delayed again, it's only natural NASA is going to look for other options if it wants to at least give the 2024 Artemis deadline a shot. Vulcan is no starship. Its promises of reusability are vague and off in the future. But what it does offer is an incremental step in development that allows ULA to continue being competitive for US government launch contracts and hopefully it can use Vulcan to bridge the divide between reusability and expendable launches into the coming decades, hopefully making ULA a more competitive launch provider. I'm Cosplus Content, and thank you for watching.